So today I'm going to be talking about The Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. It's one of his most popular works. If you've ever heard of a Freudian slip, uh, that concept comes from this book. Uh, it's also one of his most earlier works, so most earlier. So it was written in 1901. The Interpretation of Dreams, which is one of his like earliest, most popular books, was written in 1900, just a year before, or published. Um, and th I would say that there are like three main popular works by Sigmund Freud that if you've never heard of anything else, you've probably heard of this book, The Interpretation of Dreams, and then The Introductory Lectures, which is the book that I reviewed on my last video. Um, in fact, in the foreword to this book, it says only one other of Freud's works, The Introductory Lectures, rivals this one in the number of German editions it has passed through and the number of foreign languages into which it has been translated. So I think an important note on this book is that yeah, it was published in 1901 first, but like the foreword mentions, it was updated throughout Freud's lifetime. He started understanding this concept and he wanted to write about the psychopathology of everyday life. Um, and so he gathered some, some instances, some examples, and put them in his book. But then throughout his life, he collected more and more examples, more and more data, more and more evidence to back up his argument or his theory, um, either from his own personal life or as psychoanalysis became more and more widespread, other psychoanalysts would write to Freud with their examples, and he published examples from other analysts as well. If you have, if you're curious about the Freud's introductory lectures, you can check out my last review by clicking on this link up here somewhere. Okay, so this book deals with all kinds of incidents, such as forgetting, slips of the pen, slips of the tongue, mungled actions, etc. This is where the popular term, like I said, Freudian slips come from. He highlights, uh, in German, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but kind of the same in English, the root word for all of these different things is uh, miss, so like misspeaking, misspelling, mishearing, misreading, etc. Um, while also highlighting his belief and his argument was that these are not just mishaps or accidents, they are psychically determined events that have a meaning and serve a purpose. Very important. Um, again, psychically determined. If you've watched my last review, you know that he was a big fan of psychic determinism. Otherwise, that cause and effect does not just apply to external principles and factors, but everything internal, our, psych, our whole psychological makeup is also in a cause and effect motion. So with that, I mentioned that they have a meaning and they serve a purpose. What purpose, you might ask? Well, Freud says, if I analyze the cases of the forgetting of names that I observe in myself, I almost always find that the name which is withheld from me is related to a topic of close personal importance to me, but not just that, and one which is capable of evoking in me strong and often distressing affects. Okay, so you might be wondering, was an affect? According to the American Psychological Association, an affect is described as any experience of feeling or emotion ranging from suffering to elation, from the simplest to the most complex sensations of feeling, and from the most normal to the most pathological emotional reactions, often described in terms of positive affect or negative affect. Both mood and emotion are considered affective states. So in other words, Freud is saying that the purpose that forgetting the name serves is that that name is associated with something that brings about distressing emotions. And so through cause and effect, this psychically determined process causes you to forget the name so that you don't experience this distressing emotion that you don't really want to feel right now. Okay, so I think it's important to know that for things to be psychically determined and for there to be cause and effect that's happening psychologically, there has to be associations and connections built up within us all the time. So um, you, if you've probably heard of the word association test or free association, well, that was something Freud used to try and get past the defenses of forgetting. So you have forgotten something, that's a defense to protect you from that painful, distressing emotional states. So an example might be like you, maybe let's say you've broken up with your ex-girlfriend recently and her smile used to remind you of the sun because it was so bright and cheerful. 
Um, so you're trying to remember the name of the street that you grew up on, but you are forgetting the name. Um, why are you forgetting the name? Well, perhaps, you know, in the, according to this, you, it serves a purpose as it's a defense. It's trying to keep you from remembering. So you might go through a word association test. I, uh, you might think, okay, I can't remember the name of the street that I grew up on, but when I try to remember the name, I'm coming up with words like um, risen or bright. And then when I ask you, okay, well, when you, what, what comes to mind when you think of bright? You might think of uh, sunglasses. And then, oh, from sunglasses, then you think of sun. And then you think, oh, it was Sunrise Boulevard. So you finally get there. Well, the idea is that the association between sunrise and sun and sun and smile or ex-girlfriend, that association, uh, it was too distressing. It causes you to think of your ex-girlfriend even when you think of Sunrise Boulevard. Somewhere in there is the association between Sunrise Boulevard and your ex-girlfriend and you don't want to think about that right now. So your psychological process helps you to forget the name of the street to avoid feeling those painful emotional reactions. Freud stresses this is about when forgetting is out of the ordinary, when it doesn't usually happen to you, and when it causes you to stop and pause and think to yourself, wait a second, why on earth can't I remember this person's name? Um, as an example, he writes, I am as a rule only concerned with a certain group of these cases, namely those in which the forgetting surprises me because I should have expected to know the thing in question. I may add that I am not in general inclined to forget things and that for a short period of my youth, some unusual feats of memory were not beyond me. So one of the first sections in the book is on the forgetting of proper names. We've already discussed how forgetting a name can serve as a defense against unpleasant emotions. And I gave you an example of an ex-girlfriend, so I'm sorry that this might be redundant. Um, but he says that the name of a town in Italy escaped the subject's memory as a consequence of its great similarity and sound to a woman's first name, with which a number of memories charged with affect were connected. So for example, if you had traveled to, let's say, Elizabeth City last year for vacation and you go to tell someone about your trip, then you find that you're unable to recall the name of the city that you visited on vacation. Perhaps it could be due to distressing feelings you have about someone named Elizabeth. The next section I wanted to go over was on misreadings and slips of the pen. If you've ever been reading a book or a magazine or something and you read an entirely different word than the one that was printed on the page, you might understand this example pretty well. So one thing, this is kind of a transition. So we talked about the forgetting of names might defend against uh, some type of uh, distressing affect. You could call that a wish fulfillment, the wish not to feel something, right? Um, in this example of misreadings and slips of the pen, there's still a wish fulfillment there. Freud was big on wish fulfillments, but it might not necessarily be to prevent a distressing affect that might accompany remembering or you know reading the correct word. It might be for a different reason. So as an example, Freud wrote, there is one misreading which I find irritating and laughable and to which I am prone whenever I walk through the streets of a strange town on my holidays. On these occasions, I read every shop sign that resembles the word in any way as antiquities. This betrays the questing spirit of the collector. So I've talked about Freud being big into antiques before. Um, and so he's talking about, you know, going down, the, going down the street and he's in a questing spirit and then he sees a sign and he reads it as antiquities and he gets all hopeful and then finds out that that's not really what the sign says. Moving on to slips of the pen, I found a good example I wanted to use about, it's regarding Freud and Carl Jung. And some of this example, it comes from an article um, by Christine Duran titled Rage and Anxiety in the Split Between Freud and Jung. In the article, it says, Freud had pointed out a Freudian slip of the pen in the previous letter from Jung. Freud indicated to Jung that he had written, even Adler's cronies do not regard me as one of yours. When he had probably meant to write, even Adler's cronies do not regard me as one of theirs. The mistake was the difference between a capital letter and a lowercase in German. Freud was suggesting that unconsciously, Jung was no longer loyal to him. Freud also questioned whether Jung was objective enough to consider the slip without anger. Judging by the tone and content of Jung's response, the answer was no. Uh, what was Jung's response? 
Jung replied to Freud and said, You go around sniffing out all the symptomatic actions in your vicinity, thus reducing everyone to the level of sons and daughters who blushingly admit the existence of their faults. Meanwhile, you remain on top as the father, sitting pretty. For sheer obsequiousness, nobody dares to pluck the prophet by the beard. I had heard about this slip of the pen before I read this book, and I had already thought, oh, that would be a good example to use. And then, um, to my surprise, during this book, I think Freud alluded to this when he, and he, to give an example, and he wrote, I had once seen fit to reproach a loyal and deserving friend on no other grounds than the interpretation I placed on certain indications coming from his unconscious. He was offended and wrote me a letter asking me not to treat my friends psychoanalytically. I had to admit he was in the right and wrote him a reply to pacify him. So yeah, I think this is a great example of a slip of the pin on Jung's part. And it was interesting to see Freud write about his interpretation of it as coming from Jung's unconscious, you know, betraying that he was really already on the way out the door. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope you enjoy that example. Another example of a slip of the pen might be when you accidentally write the wrong date. An example could be, uh, let's say it's the beginning of the new year, it's 2024, or maybe it's already like February 2024, but you find yourself writing 2023. It could be interpreted as a way of you saying, okay, well, time is going too fast. We need to slow down. I'm not ready to be in 2024 yet. Maybe I have unfinished things in 2023, uh, you know, all of the above. Further example of a slip of the pen Freud gives is when you misspell someone's name. He wrote, what I had in fact written was Buckerhard, which the compositor guessed should be Burkhard. I had actually praised the useful treatise which an obstetrician of that name had written on the influence of birth upon the origin of children's palsies, and I was not aware of having anything to hold against him, but he has the same name as a writer in Vienna who had annoyed me by an unintelligent review of my interpretation of dreams. It is just as if in writing the name Burkhard, meaning the obstetrician, I had had a hostile thought about the other Burkhard, the writer. For distorting names is very often a form of insulting their owners, as I have mentioned above in discussing slips of the tongue. And they give a nice little example from a poem, and it's basically third plebeian. Your name, sir, truly, Sina. Truly, my name is Sina. First plebeian, tear him to pieces, he's a conspirator. Sina, I am Sina, the poet, I am Sina, the poet. Fourth plebeian, tear him for his bad verses, tear him for his bad verses. Sina, I am not Sina, the conspirator. Fourth plebeian, it is no matter, his name's Sina. Pluck his, pluck but his name out of his heart and turn him going. So in other words, if this person, even if you have no hostile feelings toward this Sina, you have hostile feelings toward this other Sina, and this person's name is Sina, so they're associated. So you want to take out your aggression on this person that's right in front of you. So the next section is the forgetting of intentions and impressions. Um, and so this is when you intended to do something and then you forgot about it. You didn't make the appointment, whatever it might be. Um, Freud wrote that I shall accordingly cite some striking examples of forgetting, most of which I observed in myself. In every case, the forgetting turned out to be based on a motive of in pleasure. He wrote, A man, Brill relates, was urged by his wife to attend a social function in which he really took no interest. Yielding to his wife's entreaties, he began to take his dress suit from the trunk when he suddenly thought of shaving. After accomplishing this, he returned to the trunk and found it locked. Despite a long, earnest search, the key could not be discovered. No locksmith was available on Sunday evening so that the couple had to send their regrets. When he had the trunk open the next morning, the lost key was found within. The husband had absentmindedly dropped the key into the trunk and sprung the lock. He assured, he assured me that this was wholly unintentional and unconscious. But we know that he did not wish to go to this social affair. The mislaying of the key, therefore, lacked no motive. The next section is on bungled actions. Can I see that recipe? I, I, well, I think it's, it's a little, little bit rude. God, no! You my hands! You oh, no! An example that he gives is, In former years, I visited patients in their homes more frequently than I do at present. And on numerous occasions, when I was at the front door, instead of knocking or ringing the bell, I pulled my own latch key out of my pocket, only to thrust it back again in some confusion. When I consider the patients at whose houses this happened, 
I am forced to think that the parapraxis, the parapraxis means like the slip up the mishap, which is taking out my key instead of ringing the bell, was in the nature of a tribute to the house where I made the mistake. It was equivalent to the thought, here I feel I am at home, for it only occurred at places where I had taken a liking to the patient. Of course, I never ring my own doorbell. So in this example, he's talking about he, you know, most times when he goes to the patient's homes, he rings the doorbell or knocks. But at these certain times, he pulls out his, his keys and he has some confusion about it. Otherwise, like, why, why did I pull out my keys here? Why today? I don't normally do this. And then he noticed a pattern of when those happened, it was usually at patients' homes that he liked. And he talked about feeling at home in that, at that area. Another example of a bungled action, uh, in talking about it, Freud says, in the last few years, during which I have been collecting such observations, I have had a few more experiences of smashing or breaking objects of some value, but the investigation of these cases has convinced me that they were never the result of chance or of unintentional clumsiness on my part. It was an accident. I, I saw him step on it. Now, as you know, as well as I do, there are no accidents. <laughs> Just admit it, Dad. Your latent hostility toward me has been building through the years, little by little, until you have finally struck the Achilles heel of my decor, the Berber carpet. When I read that, I immediately thought of a part in Schopenhauer's Porcupines by Dr. Deborah Lutnitz that I want to read to you guys. So Dr. Deborah Lutnitz gives a case example, and it's this family, the parents are arguing back and forth. This is their first session, it's like the diagnostic interview session. While the parents are arguing, um, their daughter, this is, their daughter's name is Judith, and so Dr. Lutnitz writes, they were interrupted by Judith's knocking over a bowl of marbles on my top on my toy shelf while reaching for a tissue. Never had 40 glass spheres created more havoc. When Judith bent down to pick them up, her father urged her to sit back down and answer my questions. Mrs. Kaplan shot up to grab them away from Sam, who had embarked on a tasting, then roller skated back to her chair on the ones under her feet. Again, no one cracked a smile during this little drama. They were all overwhelmed by the problem at hand. And so she's talking about later what she does, like she's reviewing, she's thinking back over that session and she's, she's trying to figure things out. So she says, um, she's talking about Judith and she says, Judith had not take sides, nor had the disagreement between the parents escalated possibly because Judith spilled the marbles. Was it her role in the family to create distractions when the parents were at odds? When we were alone, I raised the question of her parents arguing. Judith had been quick to say that she didn't worry that they would divorce or anything. I wondered if she didn't, did indeed worry about this, and if so, whether or not there was any real cause for concern. So Dr. Lutnitz is taking this bungled actions example seriously, and she noticed that while Judith was reaching for a tissue, she knocked over marbles, and that doing so created a distraction. And she's wondering if that's kind of her role in the family is to create distractions when things get too serious. It's a great book. Go check it out. Another section that's covered in the book is losing things. Um, Freud writes, it is consoling to reflect that there is an unsuspected extension of the human habit of losing things, namely symptomatic acts, and that this habit is consequently welcome at least to a secret intention of the losers. It is often only an expression of the low estimation in which the lost object is held, or of a secret antipathy toward it or towards the person that it came from, or else the inclination to lose the object has been transferred to it from other more important objects by a symbolic association of thoughts. A few important things in there. One, he mentions symptomatic acts. I didn't really cover that. That's basically anything that you do that betrays an unconscious thought. It could be, it could be knocking something over. It could be dropping something, losing something. Um, and the third point is that he said you might lose something, but it's not that 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 object gives you this distressing feeling or whatever it might be. It's that you associate that object with the actual, the bigger object that actually does. So I think that's really important to understand is that a lot of, just like a lot of times, you know, you might, you might yell at your cat or your dog, but it's not really that they did something. It's that something else is bothering you and you're taking it out on the cat or the dog for something that they did that might have reminded you of something else.
that's a bad example, but you, you, you get what I'm trying to say. Again, a lot of this is very insight oriented and the purpose is to know yourself better. If you make mistakes, if you forget things, if you missed an appointment and that's not like you, instead of just letting it go by, not thinking twice about it, it's trying to really understand yourself. What's going on here? What am I being bothered by? And Freud wrote, the road whose goal it is to observe the precept, know thyself, runs via the study of one's own apparently accidental actions and omissions, which I really appreciate that. And if nothing else, I think it would be really good to stop and think about, is there something here that's driving my forgetting, that's driving me to always miss this certain type of event? And if there is, I'm going to own up to that and I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to own it. So to kind of end this review and to end the book, Freud again circled back and these are three classifications that must be fulfilled in order for this type of scenario to be counted. So one is it must not exceed certain dimensions fixed by our judgment, which we characterize by the expression within the limits of the normal, within normal limits. Two, it must be in the nature of a momentary and temporary disturbance. The same function must have been performed by us more correctly before, or we must at all times believe ourselves capable of carrying it out more correctly. If we are corrected by someone else, we must at once recognize the rightness of the correction and the wrongness of our own psychical process. 3. If we perceive the prayer praxis at all, we must not be aware in ourselves of any motive for it. We must rather be tempted to explain it by inattentiveness or to put it down to chance. In other words, if you if you have a mishap, if you do if you have a bungled action, in order for it to really count and you to try to analyze it, it has to it has to be something outside of normal limits. It has to be um, a momentary, temporary disturbance, something that's not like if you could always perform this correctly, but this time you didn't, then that's there's something telling there. And third. A lot of times we're going to want to explain it as, oh, I was just being inattentive or that was just chance because, again, that's like us being defensive because we don't want to look into it because if we do, some painful emotional affect might arise. So if all three of those criteria are met, you can try to analyze the situation. Two last thoughts before we close. One is, so within this belief of like psychic determinism and psychodynamics, is the idea that this is like a process with an end goal. It's There's a driving force behind all of these different wishes, drives, thoughts, ideas, um, desires, and that you can't just you can't just push them down. Like they have to go somewhere. You might steer them in a different direction. You might sublimate them, but you can't just keep them pushed down and hidden. Um, as an example, he writes, in healthy people, egoistic, jealous, and hostile feelings and impulsions on which the pressure of moral education weighs heavily make frequent use of the pathway provided by parapraxies in order to find some expression for their strength, which undeniably exists but is not recognized by higher mental agencies. Acquiescence in these parapraxies and chance actions is to a large extent equivalent to a compliant tolerance of the immoral. In other words, these jealous and hostile feelings that healthy people have, a lot of times you don't express them because it would be wrong. Uh, and so those, those drives, they're going to make use of these slips of the pen, slips of the tongue, and they're going to try to come out because, to try and express themselves. They're going to try and come out. And so that's just what he's saying is that in healthy people, these hostile, angry feelings are going to make expression somehow even if in the smallest sense, they're still there and they're gonna, be, they're gonna be expressed. The last point I wanted to consider was it's kind of about making the unconscious conscious. That's a big part of psychoanalytic work back then was that if something is unconscious, it's gonna kind of possess and control you. But if you can make it conscious, then you can fiddle with it, then you can change it. Uh, Freud, he wrote, I almost invariably discover a disturbing influence in addition which comes from something outside the intended utterance. And the disturbing element is either a single thought that has remained unconscious, which manifests itself in the slip of the tongue, and which can often be brought to consciousness only by means of searching analysis, or it is a more general psychical motive force which is directed against the entire utterance. 
So again, he's saying that it's if it's in the unconscious and you don't you don't know what's the motive behind it, you're going to make slips of the pen, slips of the tongue. But if you go through analysis, if you analyze the action, then you can figure it out. And if you can figure it out, then you can change it. Another last last point is that stuff that we hold on to, whether it might be anger, it might be resentment, it might be bitterness, it might be uh, any any of those any of the above, any of those types of things. If you hold on to that, and you're not you're not even aware of it, if you hold all of that and you're unconscious and you're and you're putting all of that strain, all of that pressure on you continuously, you're just carrying that around with you. Something is going to come up. That's Freud talks about symptomatic acts, and these are for healthy people. Um, but when it gets worse, um, the other things are, are likely to start happening. Uh, I, I found this quote by Carl Jung where he says, Breuer and Freud recognized more than half a century ago that neurotic symptoms are meaningful and make sense in as much as they express a certain thought. In other words, they function in the same manner as dreams. They symbolize. A patient, for instance, confronted with an intolerable situation, develops a spasm whenever he tries to swallow. He can't swallow it. Another similar condition another patient develops, asthma. He can't breathe the atmosphere at home. A third suffers from a peculiar paralysis of the legs. He can't go on anymore. A fourth vomits everything he eats. He can't stomach it, and so on. In other words, these symptoms, they're all symbolic of something that's going on. And it can maybe be tied to a thought process. Just like if you write the wrong date, the thought process might be, the thought process might be, I'm not ready for 2024. This is going too fast. Time is going too fast. Um, similarly, if you hold on to these things for far too long and they're in your unconscious and you don't deal with them, they're going to come out in different ways. So that was the psychopathology of everyday life. Not all of it, but a good bit. Um, it's a really interesting read. I recommend you read it if you're interested in this kind of thing. I know I'm going to try to start more kind of analyzing different situations, but be careful. Don't analyze like, you know, your spouse, your children, your parents. Uh, then you might be reprimanded just like Jung reprimanded Freud. Um, but you can analyze yourself and that might lead to some self insight. I think personally, um, if you analyze every single time that you forget something and, and the forgetting is outside of the norm and it meets those criteria, you might uh, you might be wrong some of the times and trying to figure out what was the motive behind it. But I imagine that you'll be right more than you'll be wrong. That's my own personal thought. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Uh, let me know what you think of this video. And thank you for joining. If you've made it this far, I really appreciate you and your time.